continuing on then, uh, the first chapter in the, related to the text, so there are some comments and then there are texts. We don't have time to go through all of them, but we'll just look at some samples. But the first chapter is called The Discourse on Desire and talks about sidestepping sensual desire. So sensual desire, greed, and craving are kind of the focus and learning to abandon desire and crossing over, moving to a position of safety. Um, in here are some ideas about karma. Uh, the title of this one is the Karma Sutra. And uh, the Karma Sutra itself, I believe, was actually written later. So I don't think this is referring to that specific text. Um, uh, but here it talks about there being uh, two distinct views that are being contrasted here. Karma as an important and appropriate pursuit of human life and what should be avoided. Okay, so it actually has different meanings. So we have to be careful about that. Uh, but the Book of Eights falls in that ladder. What are we trying to avoid here? And so worldly things, and we looked at some of these before, fields, goods, gold, cows, horses, servants, women, relatives, and sensual pleasures bring trouble and should be abandoned and it is undoubtedly creating a clear contrast in this poem with the male Brahmins who uh, were considered, who considered these to be one of the goals in life. So uh, that's the contrast that's being made here. Uh, what differentiates the di discourse on desire from earlier literature is the former's strong emphasis on the inherent problems of karma. Becoming immortal is what one motivates renunciation of wealth and a householder life, but in the Discourse on Desire, there is no claim of an ultimate permanent state. In the Vedas, there is. You, know, you reconnect uh, the Atman, reconnects with Brahman, and you achieve an immortal state. So here there's no such claim of that. Instead, the motivation is for letting go that is the wish to become safe from danger. A very practical kind of application here. So I'm going to read the full, these are, are actually fairly short. Um, so this first one, uh, the Kama Sutra, the Discourse on Desire. When desire for sensual pleasure is fulfilled, one will surely be delighted. The mortals obtained what the mortal wanted. But if this pleasure fades away, the person with this desire, who gives birth to this desire, is pained as if pierced by an arrow. Sidestepping sensual desire, as one would, as the head of a snake with one's foot, is the mindful one who, while in this world, steps beyond craving. Through greed for fields, goods, gold, cows, and horses, servants, women, relatives, and other sensual pleasures, one's weakness overpowers. Crushed by many troubles, suffering pours in and the wa as water into a leaking boat. A person ever mindful, therefore, turns away from sensual desires, abandoning them. One will cross the flood like bailing a boat to reach the far shore. Now it isn't that you just have a boat, I mean there's some work involved here. You have to keep bailing the water out. You have to keep dealing with those desires that come up. So it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. So the check, second chapter is on the Eightfold Discourse on the Hiding Place, Seclusion from Entanglement. So the basic theme here is the theme of desire again. And the freedom can be found in the immediacy of one's present moment experience. So I'll read that one to you here. For someone sunk in confusion, or some would say ignorance, even if well concealed in a hiding place, seclusion is far away. In this world, it is not easy to let go of desires. Hard to find are those tied to wishes and bound to them 
bound to the charm of existence. Surely one isn't liberated by others. Longing for what has been and what can be, they hunger for sensual pleasures that they've had. Greedy, stingy, attached, and obsessed with desires, they are wedded to disharmony. Presented with suffering, they lament, what will become of us when we pass away from here? Therefore, you should train right here. Do not, uh, don't do what you know is out of harmony in the world. Life is short, say the wise. I see people thrashing about in the world, thirsting for states of existence. Not freed from craving, becoming, and non-becoming, lowly people weep in the face of death. I see them thrashing about in their selfishness like fish in tiny puddles of a dying stream. Observing this, live unselfishly, not forming attachments to becoming. Suffering desire for both sides, fully understanding sense experience, free of greed and doing nothing one would reproach oneself for, a stage does not attach to what one has seen or heard. Fully understanding concepts as having crossed the flood, stages don't cling to possessions. With arrow removed, living ardently, they do not long for this world or the next. So again, gives a little bit more to it. Still related to desires, but it gives us a little bit more idea of how that was seen by the Buddha. And then we have the Eightfold Course on the Corrupt, Shaking Off Every View. So this deals with the importance of becoming unattached to views and doctrines. Uh, won't go through this one, but the same kind, just give you an example of the kind of things that it's talking about, though. Uh, people's minds are corrupt, the sages don't enter into disputes, uh, don't become despondent. Uh, led by desire, struck by what is pleasing, and making up of ideas of what's correct. Uh, talking about ignoble character here versus noble character who's at peace and fully stilled. Uh, the personal advantage, uh, trying to get personal advantage, they make things up, um, and then they re uh, arrive at an unstable peace. Uh, it's not easy to overcome when you're entrenched in these things um, and a doctrine that's based on being entrenched. Rather, we want to cleanse from those view, become not becoming or non-becoming, and abandoning illusions and conceit without attachment. And so the attached one argues over doctrines and so forth, uh, but embracing nothing, rejecting nothing, right here, a person has shaken off every view. The next one is the Eightfold Discourse on the Pure, that is, nothing to grasp, another Dzogchen kind of thing. This discourse uh, redefines what it means to be a Brahmin, as we've talked about before. So I'm not, again, I'm not going to go through all of that, but you recall how he redefined that as the sage as opposed to the Brahmin as being a member of a caste or being a priest within that caste. Excuse me. The eight, next one, the Eightfold Discourse on the Ultimate is not relying on anything. So in this discourse, he advises against any religious observance or practice except letting go. The Brahman is redefined as someone who is thus. Okay. So I'll read this one to you. I think this can be helpful to us in our understanding. So the Eightfold Discourse on the Ultimate. Having views about what is ultimate, a person makes these the best in the world and calls all other views inferior. As such, they have not gone beyond quarreling. Seeing benefit in the self, or in things seen, heard, and thought, or in precepts and religious practices, and then grasping at this, a person then sees all else as inferior. What one relies on in order to see all else as inferior is an entanglement. Say those who are skilled, 
Monastics should, therefore, not depend on things seen, heard, or thought out, or on virtue and religious observances. Nor should they make up views of the world by means of knowledge, precepts, and religious observances. Nor would they think of themselves inferior or superior to others, and they shouldn't take themselves as equal. Letting go of what is taken up, the person free of grasping doesn't depend on knowledge or take sides when factions disagree or fall back on any kind of view. One not inclined to either side, to becoming or non-becoming, to here or the next world, there exists nothing to get entrenched in when considering the doctrines others grasp. Here, one does not conceive the slightest concept in regard to what is seen, heard, or thought. How in this world could one categorize the Brahman who does not take hold of views? One does not construct, prefer, or take up any doctrine. A true Brahman, not led by precepts or religious practices, who has gone beyond, does not fall back on belief is one who is thus, in quotes there. Now, chapters two through eight all had that word in it, in it dealing with the um, eightfold. And so in the earlier introduction, when he was talking about the earlier verses, and there's a little bit more on this in the afterward that we'll look at, that these four chapters, or four uh, sets of verses may actually be the earliest of the early, you know, these all being considered to be early, but those may be the earliest and they may be the source of the title of this collection as well, because it may have been these eight verse sets that were put together in very, very early history of the Buddha. Don't know for sure, but that's certainly a possibility. So chapter 6 then is the discourse on old age and this is free from selfishness. Only people's names continue after they die. The nature of self is not discussed. Selfishness is. The ideal is seeing directly knowing from letting go of clinging. The sage lives in harmony not any state of becoming. And so he goes through these basic ideas here as, as a part of this. Uh, we die in less than a hundred years normally. Uh, people grieve that they can't take things with them to the next life. Um, they um, with death, they lose the things that they consider to be theirs. They're selfishly devoted to what is mine, per se. And waking up does not see someone encountered in a dream and does not see loved ones when they are dead and so forth. The people who are greedy for what is mine and having a abandoned grasping, sages live seeing safety unattached, uh, they have a solitary seat that is in harmony and nothing is cherished or not cherished. Despair and selfishness, uh, don't, uh, they don't stick to those ideas. We're talking about sages here. And uh, so what is seen, heard, or thought uh, doesn't stick to the sage and without passion or dispassion, don't ruminate about these things, nor do they wish for purity through anything else. In chapter seven, the discourse is the discourse to Tisha uh, Metea. Uh, this was the one that was mentioned before that deals with some of the issues related to sex. In here, uh, Viveka is translated as seclusion. This discourse addresses problems of clinging to sensual pleasures and to sexual intercourse in particular. Viveka could be understood 
to focus on seclusion from or perhaps freedom from these pleasures. In other Buddhist texts, mental seclusion or detachment from desire and aversion is required both to enter deep meditation and to attain nirvana. Here it explicitly uh, emphasizes avoiding sex and describes the dangers that can befall someone whose attachment to sex operates like a vehicle out of control. <laughs> Most of the dangers mentioned involve the judgments of others, like we were talking about before. The Buddha was very concerned about the perception of others related to his followers. One who indulges in sex is called base or inferior they lose his or her good reputation and become troubled by criticism and reprimands of others. Just look at the kind of things going on in politics today. Um, so he said that the wise one would live a celibate single life. And I think that there's a relationship, as I mentioned before, to a principle in Indian culture itself. Um, Buddha adds, those who train in seclusion should not think of themselves as superior, however. In ancient India, celibacy was often considered purer than non-celibacy. The temptation for renunciates is to think they were better than others uh, must have been strong, but such conceit stands in the way of freedom. Okay. So even though there's an emphasis on celibacy, there's kind of a warning there not to get conceited about that. So in this sutra, it's called the Discourse to Tisa Mitea. And uh, Tisa is a male that we're talking to here. Explain, sir, the danger for someone addicted to sex. Having heard your teaching, we will train in seclusion. And so the Blessed One then said to Mitea, For those addicted to sex, the teachings are forgotten, and the practice is mistaken. It is something ignoble to them. Whoever had lived the single life, then indulges in sex like a vehicle out of control, so been in a monastic or homeless type of life and then rejected that or moved out of that, and becomes a, like a vehicle out of control, is an ordinary person known in this world as base. Whatever praise and fame on one hand will surely waste, waste away. Seeing this, one should train in giving up sex. Overcome by thoughts for sex, one burns like a wretch pauper. In hearing disapproval from others, one becomes even more troubled. Criticized by other, one fashions swords. Having great greed, one sinks into falsehoods. One is known as wise when resolved on living the single life, but when attached to sex, one is a troubled fool. Knowing these dangers here, a sage, both earlier and later, should become firm in the single life and not indulge in sex. One should train in seclusion. This, for noble ones, is supreme. Who would not, because of that, think oneself superior is close to nirvana. People bound to sensual desires envy the sage living free and be free from addiction, basically, who, unconcerned with sensual desires, has crossed beyond the flood. Okay. Then in chapter 8, the discourse to Pasura, not opposing any views. So in this one, the views are... Uh, talks about what the views are. The ideal person doesn't contest such claims, doesn't cling to anything as being ultimate. So there is no peace, he says, in clinging. So I won't go through this one either. You get the basic idea here of this one, so you don't want to cling to things. And by not clinging, we arrive at a state of peace. 
The next one is called the Discourse to Magadia, and here you're talking about peace without view. So it's similar in a way. So through not clinging to any doctrines or views, he's experienced inner peace. What he means by inner peace, the Buddha doesn't say directly. Those who are peaceful, who have no desire for states of becoming because they have let go. So he mostly defines it in terms of letting go of those things. So the Buddha has altogether rejected views, learning, precepts, and religious practices as a part of this. Do not these do not characterize peace, but could have a role along the path to peace as a part of this. Again, so he goes through this discussion uh, with this individual talking about those various views and getting attached to those views, letting go of those views and arriving at inner peace. So by letting go, not grasping and not being dependent upon those, then they are peaceful and do not hunger for any form of becoming. And here, I'll, I'll read this one because it relates to that other discussion we had, letting go of home, wandering without a household, not becoming intimate with villagers, free from sensual desire, free of expectations, a sage won't quarrel with people. The tenth chapter then is the discourse before breaking apart, so peaceful and independent. So peace, again, is the main theme here. Don't crave or cling to anything. Don't be angry, fearful, greedy. Don't be concerned with sensual pleasures, not attached to doctrines or views, have no possessions, and not being dependent on anything. Peace is present when the craving or clinging is absent. So reinforcing pretty much everything that we have just seen. The claim that sages aren't guided by views must have seemed rather peculiar because that was the main theme in terms of some of the other groups at that time. The Buddha describes sages as faithless, but this is a form of wordplay. Sages are faithless because they become peaceful. They no longer need faith. Similar wordplay, is the sages don't free themselves from passion because they've already done so. You know, that's, that's a very Dzogchen kind of a, a view of things as well. So in a few instances, particular behavior and qualities are attributed to an ideal person at peace, teaching without pride, being gentle, intelligent, equanimous, and mindful but not dependent upon anything. So those are the main principles being stressed in that one. The discourse on quarrels and disputes, understanding conditionality is the next one in chapter 11. Because they are conditional, attainments cannot be ultimate. And if they are not ultimate, they cannot serve as a reliable basis for debates and conceits about one's religious faiths, beliefs, and attainments. So this one uh, brings up the issue of Atman, or the eternal self or soul. And what is cherished is the basis, the basis for that is desire. So sort of the foundation for pleasantness and unpleasantness is sense contact. Sense contact depends on the presence of the names and appearances. For form and names in the 12 links of dependent origination are the usual way that that is expressed here. And this one deals with what might be an early version of the 12 links, but it doesn't have the full set of 12 links involved. But it does have name and appearances as the foundation for contact. And then contact becomes the foundation for pleasantness, unpleasantness. Pleasantness, unpleasantness is the foundation for desire. Desire is the foundation for what is cherished. And what is cherished leads to quarrels and so on. Okay, so it's a similar kind of a sequence of events that we see in the 12 links of dependent origination. And in uh, this one, 
And then uh, for the Buddha, appearances arise together with conceptualization. Distinguishing one appearance from everything else arises together with our naming of appearance. So when we conceptualize things, we see a form and we link that with the name and put that together. That's what leads to all of these other problems, if you will. The mind retains the capacity to conceive, remaining conscious and alert. Concepts and disappearance doesn't lead to the disappearance of appearances. The concept of uh, an event is different from the event itself. The idea of something disappearing is not the same as its actual disappearance. It is possible that the Buddha is describing a particular set state of meditation where ordinary perception and conceptualization cease. So we're not sure exactly how uh, what he was referring to here in that context. The Buddha explains two different attainments that some people hold as the highest. The first is a meditative state that can be reached while one is still alive. The second occurs when there is no residue of grasping, complete freedom is not attained until death. The Buddha neither agrees nor disagrees with these claims to the highest form of purity. Instead, he says these claims are conditional and that sages study the conditional nature of things. The implication is that these are not ultimate. A liberated person who knows does not associate with becoming or non-becoming. Someone who is liberated is unconcerned with whether or not the self continues after death. Okay. It just is as it is. Okay, so then the next one is the shorter discourse on the, uh, on the dead end, living without conflict. Uh, in here, he says that there is really only one truth. This is the only occurrence in the entire Pali Canon where the Buddha says there is only one truth. And it contradicts his claim earlier that he doesn't speak of anything as truth. So this brings up the possibility that this is something that got added in there at a later point in time. Most likely, this phrase, there is only one truth, is a rhetorical statement expressing the viewpoint of those who assert their own claims as truth. And that would make a lot of sense in terms of how, this, how we see this in other kinds of contexts. So for the Buddha, there are not many varied constant truths in the world. These varied truths are all ideas conceptualized in the mind, thus reinforcing the instruction of being wary of concepts. The only thing the Buddha offers in this discourse is the possibility of living without conflict. So that's an <coughs> overview of the content of that. In the next one, chapter 13, the greater discourse of the dead end, peace instead of doctrine. So now he's addressing these issues of doctrine. Uh, it says basically doctrine leads nowhere. It's a dead end. So here we need to focus on peace, a peace that doesn't need a doctrine. I mean, you could argue that peace becomes a doctrine, uh, but what he's really talking about here, and the reason that I made my statement previously, is that's not the goal. It becomes a doctrine when you make it the goal. It, if you look at it in terms of something that manifests as a result of uh, some other approach, then it's not specifically a goal. People who avoid attachments to views are called sages. And they are referred to as Brahmins in this particular poem. Socially, sages are peaceful among those not at peace. So that, that's a good goal <laughs> in terms of our environment, being able to remain at peace in, in our environment. And they are not led by others who do not follow any faction involved in a dispute. So doctrinally, sages neither argue the validity of any doctrine nor hold up any doctrine as superior. On a personal level, sages have equanimity and have laid down their burden, the attachments they once held. 
the contaminants or taints are um, oh, the, the Book of H does not explain what these contaminants or taints are. In earlier, other early literature, they are listed as central craving, becoming, or attachment to the three realms, and ignorance. There are slightly different lists. Uh, when we were looking at the words of Buddha, um, it had several lists in there, slightly different versions of what those taints are considered to be. The alternative is non-clinging. True Brahmins cling to nothing whatsoever, not even peace. Okay, so we have to be careful even about clinging to that. The next one, chapter 14 now, is the first of the two that are related more specifically to monastics. And so this is the discourse on being quick. Release is peace. And so this one describes how monastics should train and talks about the code of monastic discipline as a part of that. It includes the degree of reverence and respect for the Buddha that's not seen in other chapters. It gives a number of different titles to the Buddha. Earlier chapters, the Buddha is referred to as Sir only once, Gotama only once. The monastic training described in this chapter is essentially a long list of behaviors that should be avoided, so primarily dealing with ethics. And there's one mention of being mindful. This is consistent with the strong emphasis on the earlier chapters on letting go. And freedom isn't found from doing anything, it's found by not clinging and avoiding behaviors that arise from clinging is the path to the end of clinging and this is the re and the release is peace so uh, this is compared to uh, having having a mind that is still and unmoving like a calm sea and having a still peaceful mind so we won't go through the specifics on these. It gives you the idea of the content here. In chapter 15, this is the discourse on being violent, and it's called Training in Peace. So it deals with impermanence and the fact that everything is changing. For those who want to be at peace, pull out the arrow that is causing much suffering. Uh, so nirvana here is uh, referred to as full release and then later as a transcendent reality full release reinforces the idea that release is peace so as I mentioned sometimes nirvana is described as peace the training is prescribed uh, that is prescribed here consists almost entirely of activities to be avoided just as in the previous example the only training mentioned that should be taken up is being truthful so again kind of an ethical position excuse me those who succeed are unshakable and even-minded free of cruelty greed and agitation the goal is becoming free from agitation then, unshaken and peaceful. And the arrow stuck in the heart is greed. Selfish possessiveness in thinking uh, and having the sense of mine. Having pulled out those out, sages are peaceful and unselfish. So it goes through a list of a number of those things. And then the final chapter here is the Discourse to Shariputra on monastic training. So again, focusing very much on the monastic community. Uh, here the goal is awakening. And so awakening is often a translation of the, the term Buddha. Uh, as we have seen before, when the Buddha first encountered somebody who expressed, who are you? And he said, I am one who is awake, and hence the term Buddha came from that. And so here it is awakening and also obliterating the darkness. So it's not just the awakeness, but it's getting rid of those other characteristics. 
this is the only of these poems, the 16 poems, that in this collection uses the word Buddha. Uh, so in the beginning, Shariputra is the one who speaks. The first eight verses come from him. And some think that it may be a later addition to the poem. It uses a different meter, for example, and concepts that are not found elsewhere in the Book of Eights. It stands in contrast to the teachings of the, that the Buddha gives in the remaining verses as well. So a number of different reasons why it may have been a later addition. He describes the sage and true Brahman as one who is independent of precepts and religious practices. Yet here, Shariputra equating Buddhist practices with these very activities. Okay, so we see some, some conflicts here. The earlier discourses advocate what sages don't do and what they should abandon doing. This emphasizes changes with the discourses to Shariputra, where the Buddha presents a series of actions and a number of attitudes. Monastics should be firm in their exertion, revere wisdom, enjoy what is admirable, be satisfied, engage in meditative absorption, be ever wakeful and collected, be happy when reprimanded, free uh, freely offer skillful words, a, examine a, the right dharma, and become unified. In addition, monastics should touch with loving kindness those who tremble and those who are firm. So the teachings here are for those who are still in training. And so that goes through and talks about these various characteristics as well as a part of that. So we're going to again take a short break here.